The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s swept away many of the barriers to equal rights faced by African Americans and other minorities. What is the legacy of this pivotal era in American history? What problems still need correcting? And is affirmative action still part of the solution? To find out, Policy Watch is joined this week by Michael Barone, senior writer and editor of U.S. News and World Report and author of The Almanac of American Politics and Hugh Price, former president of the Urban League and the author of Achievement Matters, Getting Your Child the Best Education Possible. Now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besheroff. Hugh Price, Michael Barone, welcome to you both. We are delighted to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Let's talk about race. Um, and the years since Brown v. Board of Education, the landmark Supreme Court case that essentially outlawed racial discrimination in public schools. Hugh Price, you were part of that history here in Washington, D.C., weren't you? Yeah, I was part of the first contingent of black students to integrate the Washington, D.C. schools. Uh, there was a companion decision to Brown called Bowling v. Sharp, which applied to D.C., and I entered Taft Junior High School in 1954. It had been a white junior high school. How many African Americans came in with you? We came in two, two contingents. The first contingent, I don't want to be overly technical, was kids who were not in the public schools the year before, and I happened to be at Georgetown Day School that year before, so I came in the first contingent. And then several weeks later, the second contingent came in. The first wave, if you will, was pretty quiet. The second wave, which involved larger numbers, triggered some protests by white students, and strangely enough, a number of the white students invited those of us who had black students who'd come in first to join them in the protests against our brothers coming in later. And we said, there's something wrong with this picture. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so it, uh, you know, there was, there, was, there was more tension inside the school during those early years than there was at the start of integration. The, the reception of black kids in the school was not anything like what it was in Little Rock and, and other no, It wasn't violent, but it also wasn't pleasant. How so? Um, well, there's very little social interaction. Um, there was there was some physical tension. Um, our homeroom teacher got the idea that several of uh, my class, black classmates and I should serve as hall monitors, uh, standing in between the two different rows of kids passing between uh, classes during the breaks, and that just turned us into punching bags. So we had to straighten that out in the stairwell in between classes, and we did. Um, and there, you know, there was there wasn't a lot of invective, but it was it was tense, and uh, um, there weren't a lot of friendships, although um, there were some. And uh, um, it so it was it it wasn't a pleasant environment, but it it wasn't anything like what we read about in Little Rock or elsewhere. Yeah. Michael, there's a argument about what's left of the civil rights agenda, how much racial discrimination is left, and what's left in the formal civil rights. Well, and I think another anniversary that we need to note, and I think wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about this, is the 40th year anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which in many ways was more immediately effective in changing behavior and changing America for the better uh, than the Brown decision, which took years uh, through the judicial process to achieve um, large-scale uh, racial integration and, in southern schools. And less schools. legitimacy because it was a... It, well, was a the Civil Rights Act uh, produced uh, very fast compliance, by and large, in public accommodations and workplaces. I'm not saying complete compliance, but very and very different uh, behaviors than I think many people, both supporters as well as opponents of the Civil Rights Act, feared. I mean, they, you know, we'd just gone through the Freedom Rides period where black... Uh, attempting to ride on buses were physically and violently assaulted and these terrible things. Uh, and, uh, and yet the public accommodations and restaurants and so forth in the South pretty well accepted uh, integration. So where is the role of government today? Um, Let's hold up for Hugh, would you agree that the Civil Rights Act saw a much more rapid implementation? And Those areas to which it applied. Um, I mean, eliminating 
segregation is very different from promoting integration. Those are two different impulses. And I think in, certainly in public accommodations and in some of the more overt areas of discrimination in the workplace, we saw a good deal of progress. But, you know, within a couple of years after the Civil Rights Act, we, we saw the advent of affirmative action. Uh, you saw the black power movement. You saw aggressive steps by uh, colleges and universities to open their ranks. You saw moves by employers to open their ranks. And that wasn't directly attributable to the Civil Rights Act. I think the Civil Rights Acts were hugely important, but they're part of a continuum of public and private actions. And you're both lawyers. I want to stay on this difference between Supreme Court action and legislation for just a second, because it is said that one of the reasons we are in a continuing debate about abortion is because it's been dealt with by the courts as opposed to by the legislature. So there hasn't been a political resolution that people can say, okay, we had an argument, we took a vote, and we made a decision to move forward. Um, Michael, do you think part of it was that it was the, the legislature speaking, that this was a major political act, the president got involved? This well, was I think the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and I'd add the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which was hugely successful in opening the ballot boxes to black Americans who'd been excluded uh, in much of the Deep South and by a system of kind of violence and terror as well. That was hugely successful. Uh, I yeah, think I think that going through the political process, people watched as President Kennedy endorsed the Civil Rights Act in June 63 uh, in response to many of the things that were going on in Birmingham, Alabama, and other places. They watched as the senators filibustered and as the Southern opponents of this were given a chance to make their case at great length. And uh, they watched as a consensus developed among two-thirds of the nation or more that this is something we should do, that it was important uh, to the character of America. And yes, I think that built uh, more popular support and, in, and, and led to the inspiration of less overt opposition uh, than a court decision uh, would have done. I mean, we, we, when you go to law school, you're often taught that, uh, you know, lawyers and courts make all the right, make huge amounts of difference. But I think in this case, uh, legislation played a role. And as Hugh said, I, I, I think was referring to, the civil rights movement itself, led by black Americans, really played an educational role for the rest of us in this country. Well, and the, the, the Brown decision, I mean, it didn't just impact schools. Um, it, it opened up, uh, it, it eliminated residential segregation in many parts of the country. I mean, I, I grew up in Washington. Starting in 1953 and 54, as you saw the decisions coming, families began moving up 16th Street into the so-called Gold Coast. Families moved to the so-called Silver Coast. So residential segregation began to broke break down, although that didn't last long, is recongealed as there was a lot of blockbusting and families sort of scattered to the suburbs. But we saw an immediate impact in many realms of American life. The Civil Rights Act accelerated that in other realms of American life where there was resistance. And then we should not forget the executive orders from President Nixon not long after the Civil Rights Act, which, you know, with the contract set-asides and other aggressive moves to promote uh, inclusion in various walks of life. So there are various forms of government action, court decisions, legislation, executive orders that made a difference. We'll get to those in a minute, but I, I, I want to share with you, get out of the role of moderator for just a second, uh, but I was in Clarksdale, Mississippi as a young civil rights worker in 1968, and the structure of the Voting Act Voting Rights Act was really quite remarkable. One went to a federal magistrate to register people. Wherever I went, I asked if the, the blacks if they were registered, and if not, it was my job to take people to the federal magistrate. One day my car broke down, I went into this. One had to, one did not, if you were a northern civil rights worker, <laughs> go to the local uh, gas station. So I went into the, you know, what, the, the, whatever it was called, that neighborhood. Uh, and I did what I was supposed to do. Is everybody here registered? No. We took six carloads of young men, and we went to the federal magistrate in the federal courthouse, and that was how it was done, because no one dared go to the state process. And I watched. I was there uh, living with Aaron Henry, who was the leader of the Mississippi Democratic Party, and I watched white, as, that, as we were carrying people to the court, I watched white politicians coming to him asking for support in the elections. Right. It turned on a dime, Michael. It just turned on a dime like that because yeah. there were votes. This is Strom Thurmond, uh, the segregationist uh, 
longtime segregationist, uh, procured the first appointment of a black federal judge in Southern State. Yeah, there, I mean, there are obviously many challenges remaining, even though we've made tremendous progress. I mean, one of them, as you look at the disparate treatment along racial lines in the criminal justice system, is just stark difference in arrest rates, incarceration rates, uh, et cetera, and police will testify to this, judges will testify. So Jim Crow is still roaming around in the criminal justice system in a big way. Let, let's, I mean, let's yeah. talk about those one by one, because yeah. I think we are now at a point where we're not going to agree so easily. I think Mike, Mike, Michael might have a different view of what you just said about the criminal justice system. Well, I think that there may be some of what Hugh is describing. I simply don't know as a factual matter. I mean, I think uh, the fact remains that, unfortunately, crime rates among Americans of African descent seem to be higher than those of Americans of other descent. This is not something that makes me happy, rather to the contrary. Um, but I'm talking about all of the things being equal, the treatment inside the criminal justice system when the circumstances are similar. Uh, it's quite different. I mean, I've, I've heard uh, an appellate court judge, uh, Barrington Parker, speak to this very eloquently. The statistics are quite alarming, and there are other studies which show disparities that are, that are very stark. Um, another area that's, that's uh, worrisome to this day is that surveys of employers who receive identical resumes from people with what appear to be African-American names as opposed to white names treat the African-American applicants much worse in terms of calling them in for interviews, callbacks, et cetera. So there are, we've made tremendous progress as a society and as a people, but there are realms of American life where there are stark distinctions based on race. And then there are spheres of American life like education where there may not be racial discrimination per se, but there are conditions that children of color face that still um, are, that require major attention and major interventions. And uh, those aren't civil rights issues per se, but they're major societal needs that be, need to be addressed. Michael. Well, I, I think I agree with most of that, uh, if not, you, you, I mean, the basic thrust is there. I think, and, and here I suspect I'm going to get some disagreement. Uh, that the system that we have of racial quotas and preferences um, started, as you mentioned, by President Nixon uh, and continued by other administrations and now sanctioned by the, in the university and graduate school admissions by the Supreme Court last year. Uh, to me, this is uh, something that is in some ways harmful to the intended beneficiaries because uh, using my categories of hard America, soft America. This is in your new book. In my new book, Hard America, Soft America. I think the impulse to create racial quotas and preferences was a benign one, born out of a feeling that this society had been too harsh to black Americans, a feeling that uh, most Americans came to feel um, and were persuaded of by the civil rights movement uh, and other circumstances. But I think that the problem with segregation in terms is, was that it was not a hard system in the sense that I used the term. Uh, it was, blacks were not subject to too great a competition. They were excluded from competition. They were not allowed to compete in most of the private sector economy. They were not allowed to compete in education systems. They were excluded from these things. Uh, and the civil, thrust of the civil rights movement, of course, is inclusion. I fear that racial quotas and preferences tend to encourage a sort of soft approach. If you hold people to lower standards, they're not going to achieve higher standards, uh, or they're going to be less likely to do so. And there are social science studies that show that black students perform better on tests for which there are practical consequences. I think some of the programs that Hugh has been pointing out are an attempt um, to, in, in my terms, harden the schools, provide uh, incentives for achievement, and uh, are things that I vastly admire uh, and I think are really necessary to solve this problem in racial gap in, in learning, which is, to me, one of the most uh, worrisome and unhappy features of American life today. Well, I think on the impact of affirmative action, we're going to have what they, in diplomats speak, they call it a frank exchange of views. Um, I think the impact of affirmative action has been extraordinarily beneficial for our society. Um, it has opened up realms of uh, American life that had been closed, whether you're talking about the 
corporate workplace when I was coming along in college. I distinctly remember working at the Veterans Administration in Washington where the only blacks working there were messengers and secretaries um, virtually. In, in the corporate workplace, that was the case as well. And affirmative action dramatically opened all of those realms of American life to people who were prepared, qualified, motivated, et cetera. Um, the African-American middle class, I have read, quadrupled um, in the aftermath of affirmative action. And, uh, and, and that happened in one of two ways. Either people rose, as I believe they did, from working class or poverty status. And for those who argue with that, the only alternative is that the birth rate in the African-American middle class would have quadrupled, which I don't think happened or people descended out of the African-American upper class, which I don't think happened. So there clearly has been economic progress within our community as a result of the openings. All of that said, it has not reached those who are not terribly well educated, not terribly well supported in their families and communities, uh, don't have a dose of good luck, et cetera. And so we've got to attend to the support and academic preparation of folks who have not made the journey into the mainstream. So I think affirmative action as a way of promoting inclusion in a society that was very exclusive when I was a kid has been enormously helpful. It has prepared people, uh, uh, propelled people into uh, the mainstream and into the middle class, but it hasn't reached most of our people, and therefore we've got a whole nother agenda that we've got to be about in this day and age. The point of those of us who believe in affirmative action is that we need to promote robust inclusion in the most robustly diverse society uh, on earth. We've got to make that work. And we've got to realize that all sorts of judgments are made um, that aren't strictly by the numbers. I have a different question. Michael, you write about demography in this country. And for all our history until about two or three years ago, African Americans were our largest, mo forgetting about immigrant groups. Well, but that's forgetting about a lot. Okay. We'll get the, the and you feel free to mention that, but African Americans were our most deserving minority group for special treatment because of slavery, because of Jim Crow, and so forth. I think it was two years ago that Hispanic Americans now became the largest minority. We have large numbers of other immigrants, and it seems to me we have two issues arising, whether it's about affirmative action, not about um, uh, anti-segregation laws, but about affirmative action with two issues come, that have arisen. One, will these other groups feel as responsible for the condition of African Americans? Will they want to give that special step up for African Americans? And two, will they want to take advantage of the same sets of rules because in the name of diversity? Well, I think we've, you know, these categories, the Hispanic category was invented by the census in the early 1970s, I believe. Uh, Asian Americans, another category, and including Pacific Islanders, uh, is also in some, is a category that includes Israelis, Palestinians, Koreans, and other people of wide variety of provenances. Um, and all these race categories are artificial constructs. Um, they are different in different societies. They are different at different times in societies. Uh, my, my book, The New Americans, How the Melting Pot Can Work Again, which was published in May 2001, makes the argument that, that minority so groups of today resemble immigrant groups of 100 years ago. Blacks resemble Irish. Latinos resemble Italians. Asians resemble Jews. Obviously, there's not one-to-one -one similarities, and there's certainly differences between black Americans' historic experience and those of every other group. But a lot of resemblances there, and they're not and differences between the different groups and within the different groups. Um, 1912, an expert on race testifies before a United States Senate committee. He is asked the question, "Is the Italian a white man?" And the expert says, "No, sir, he is a dago." Um, you had uh, at that time, if you listen to the discourse of a hundred years ago, the Italians, the Irish, the Jews were all separate races uh, and were spoken of as such. That word was used and considered by many to be inferior races and uh, problematic people that would never fit into this society and could never become uh, interwoven into the American fabric. Uh, I think, obviously, um, those uh, naysayers proved wrong and that uh, we have interwoven new peoples into the fabric before and we, we're doing it again.
uh, perhaps not as well as we should, and assimilating uh, as well as we should in some ways, as I made the argument in that book. But, but doing a better job than any other society on Earth at it. We work yeah. harder at that than any other society. And we do Earth. have, and one of the interesting things, race in the 2000 census, uh, respondents were given the opportunity to claim multiple races. And as I recall, a large, relatively large percentage, particularly of those under 30, who said that they were black, African-American, Negro, whatever, also claimed another race. And we are becoming a country just as we are multi-ethnic. I mean, my uh, ancestry is, includes uh, Italian-Americans on my father's side and Irish-Americans on my mother's side. Uh, they were married in 1943. That was a mixed marriage back then uh, for many people. Um, we are becoming a country where we have, where our great grandchildren in that generation will have multiple uh, ethnic, racial backgrounds that have been categorized in a different way. Immigrants from Latin America are utterly puzzled by our racial distinctions. They come from societies with different sets of racial distinctions and categories. And when they're asked on the census what race they are, half of them say other. I, I remember visiting Brazil in the mid 1980s, expecting to, to uh, you know, descend on the most multi-ethnic, open society because we'd heard all those wonderful things, and it was as stratified, rigidly stratified along color lines as any society I'd ever seen. Um, I, th I mean, the upside is I think America works harder and better at making diversity and inclusion work than any other society on earth. We are a work in progress on that front. We are, uh, I, th I think there is a, a melding and we are coming to terms with this. What all of these methods are designed to do is to try to make sure that we promote inclusion on the upside and prevent a reversion to uh, segregation and to tokenism on the, on the downside. And I think we're making tremendous progress as a society there as people get an opportunity to demonstrate um, what, they're, what they're capable of. I think I interrupted you earlier. Hugh, on, on this question, many people think that the, the, the major next step, not all, but the major next steps in what we used to call the civil rights agenda are economic and social, and that we're now as much, I don't want to say it's not about race, but it is race tinged with class. Oh, I would agree with that. I think when you look at the, the educational challenges that our society faces and our people face, the educational challenges of rural white kids, um, uh, urban Latino or uh, you know Latino children, urban black kids, wherever the challenges of children who are benign, ben behind academically are societal challenges that cut across economic lines, have some racial, sub you know, substantial racial overtones, but we've got to address them as a totality. Um, the questions of economic growth, we see lots of t statistics indicating that sort of you know working class people are really struggling, middle class is sort of. Uh, in a, in a flat mode economically. So I, I think that um, there are specific issues to race. There's you know, discrimination still in the labor force. There is discrimination still in the criminal justice system. But there are issues related to that intersect between race and class that have to be addressed. And you see them particularly in education and in economics and in the health care system as well. Michael, I'd like to ask you a slightly different question. OK. Uh, so in your book, The New Americans, as you mentioned, you equate in, in, in many ways, you draw parallels between the Irish and African Americans. And I think it's the case that for more than 100 years, the Irish were reliable uh, Democratic voters. And it was only in the middle or the latter half of, this, of the last century, of the 20th century, where they started voting Republicans. Blacks now also are re reliable voters on the Democratic side. Is that going to change in our lifetime? Um. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a curious it's a curious phenomenon when any group we is solidly for one party. We had white Southerners uh, from most of the South. There were a couple exceptions, like East Tennessee, voting 90 plus percent for the Democratic Party from uh, the 1860s until uh, the 1940s and 50s. Uh, so that's sort of a uh, partisan, you know, s virtual unanimity among an identifiable group uh, with some self-conscious, you know, self-awareness uh, can continue for a long time. I mean, it's, it's ironic. This was really galvanized the, by 
in many ways by Barry Goldwater's opposition to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If you look for the sort of germ at the moment at which black Americans suddenly began voting 90 percent, what's ironic is that actually a higher proportion of Republicans than of Democrats voted for the Civil Rights Act. Majorities in both parties did. Uh, and that Barry Goldwater, made, as a department store owner in Phoenix, integrated his staff, wanted to make sure that blacks were getting equal salaries back in the late 1940s when this wasn't common practice among a management class, but it, just something that he felt he ought to do. Um, but there you go. He did oppose the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And, um, and Lyndon Johnson was its champion. Yeah, and, uh, and Kennedy so was a champion, and FDR, and Harry Truman. Although reluctantly, but yeah, well, but, but there were the, the, the images. The that Truman was Truman was good on civil rights, so was Dewey for his time. Yeah, yeah. Tr Truman desegregated the armed services. He was the president. Um, so there's an association with certain historic events, and uh, it'll you know depends on what you what you say, and then more importantly what you do, and. Uh, there are strong reasons why blacks are associated with the uh, Democratic Party. Well, somebody once asked me if I knew any black Republicans. I said, I know all the black Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Barone. <laughs> Michael Barone, Hugh Price, thank you very much. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.